the rather definitely um, mathematical, almost diagrammatic way in which our ancient forebears developed their concepts of astroanalysis is of very definite interest to us now because it may form an important part of the future study of psychology. Many things that do not seem probable at a given time become more probable as our knowledge enlarges and our tolerance broadens. The general psychology as we have it is very close to astrology in many of its techniques even now. And the similarity is almost certain to improve with years. The ancients evolved a system of basic concepts as to the use and abuse of sidereal energy. Also the ancients perhaps were among the first to recognize the universe as our principal conditioning environment. We cannot escape entirely the influence of the way of life in which we exist as creatures. This way of life was not devised by us, but constitutes a vast universal background within which we carry on our own assorted projects. We are therefore creatures possessing a measure of individuality, continually using and abusing energies. The natural use of energy is always to affect normalcy, to result in an harmonious adjustment between the individual and his world. The abuse of energy always threatens this harmonious adjustment. And when this adjustment is at part at least destroyed, the person himself suffers from the consequences. This suffering, of course, extends beyond the individual and may very often become world problem. Problem is always the result of the lack of harmonious use of energies. This lack may arise from ignorance in which the human being simply does not know how to use energies that are vastly beyond his own comprehension. The second cause of trouble is a calculated effort to exploit or pervert energies, as we find in individuals who have permitted selfishness and other faults to dominate their conduct. Where we are unable to cope with energy because we do not understand it, we proceed by way of trial and error. We attempt various experiments with life. This experimentation has been going on since the dawn of time. And from these experiments we learn certain useful facts. We learn to measure at least what we can do and what we cannot do safely. We realize that certain causes inevitably produce consistent results. And wherever we find that a cause produces a detrimental result, or a result which is not harmonious with our security and well-being, we make note of this. And from the note so taken, we have developed a variety of beliefs and opinions. Inasmuch as the vast collective in which we exist has anciently been regarded as a divine structure and the mysterious laws governing it have been regarded as the will of God, it became obvious to primitive people, strongly religious in their inclinations, that the universe was constantly attempting to teach us something and that this revelation was the revealing of the will of God for creatures. From this revelation of the divine will, 
we are reasonably certain that most of our scriptural writings originated. They came from persons who were inwardly illumined to the degree that they apprehended or understood certain operations of natural law which were not obvious to the average semi-informed person. From the same contemplation, philosophy gathered most of its ethical structure, its recognition of right and wrong, its ability to formulate codes, political, cultural, ethical, for the improvement of society and the perpetuation of worthy and proper institutions. From this same general reservoir of observation and reflection came also the beginnings of science, the recognition of those laws with which man must cooperate, laws which also continually invite an improvement, an enlargement of human empire. Thus from a primitive observation, perhaps on the fields of Babylon long ago, Western man gained his point of view. He also learned as he went along that this point of view was not imaginary. It was not merely something he had conjured up out of his own imagination. This point of view was rooted and grounded in real observational knowledge. It proved itself again and again, and wherever man attempted to deviate from these basic courses, he found himself in trouble. All of this forms together a kind of world psychological science a science of the understanding of the principles operating the life forces with which we exist. And in the effort to understand these forces, man turned not only to the vast universe around him, but to the smaller universe within him. He became convinced in his own way that his body was a kind of miniature of this universal pattern. That through the study of his own parts and functions, through a gradual analysis of his own nature and character, he was able also to arrive at useful knowledge, factual knowledge, suitable to assist him in the perpetuating of his own purposes, especially if these purposes were worthy and proper. Man therefore learned that his body has its laws, that these laws depend very largely upon the larger pattern which is their source, but that universal procedure is continuously operating in human life, and that man himself must keep the same rules uh, within his nature that he must obey in the larger world about him. Naturally, all human beings desire health and happiness, and out of a study of nature, man has discovered something about the laws ruling health and happiness. He learned, first of all, that for him a happy, healthy condition must arise from obedience. He must keep rules. He must discipline himself against the natural instinct and tendency to regard himself as a completely free and ungoverned creature. He must also be aware that self-government itself is not sufficient unless this self-government is rooted in an understanding of universal law. Therefore, man must experience self-government as a voluntary obedience with the rules of his kind. For if he disobeys these rules, regardless of his motives, certain disasters will result. The most common disasters that we know are misery and sickness. Misery being largely emotional mental problems in which the individual becomes culturally ill. Pain or sickness represents interference with the normal function of physical law. We observe that certain inharmonies arise within the body. Unless these are corrected, the body must suffer. And we have come to know, finally, that the body cannot be merely exploited by its owner. The body is not merely here to permit the individual to do as he pleases. It is here to permit him to function normal, function normally if he does as he must or as he should, 
or as intelligence indicates would be desirable for him. Out of this uh, series of observations, our primitive ancestors in medicine, particularly, came to the conclusion that health arises from an harmonious use of energies. That health, in order to be maintained, must have beneath it an enlightened purpose in conduct. Health must be watchfully guarded. It must be cultivated as the natural and proper state of man. Health is not extraordinary. Health is ordinary. It is the common proper state of things, that in the various periods of their living, they shall fulfill these periods constructively, and that at the different stages of life, there are different levels of health to which each individual can aspire and which he can attain in most instances through understanding and obedience. Now this does not mean that man is as yet possessed with an infallible guide by means of which he can in all things move correctly. There are forces around him and within him which he yet does not know and which will continue to present him with problems. These problems are invitations for further thoughtfulness in order that he may gradually conquer the unknown and apply his newly made discoveries uh, to the security of his own existence and the way of life for those around him. This is, of sense, a summary of astrological philosophy. And while it may be derived from unorthodox sources, I believe that we will ultimately learn that it is essentially true, reasonable, and proper. In fact, perhaps more of common sense than that which now passes for scientific exactitude. So this morning we want to bring out a series of points which we think will be helpful to individuals now in order that something may be done to combat the consistently increasing dis-ease with which individuals are afflicted. Now if this morning we do not uh, make a series of wonderful optimistic remarks about all the different signs and their peoples, uh, please forgive me. We are not here this morning to say how wonderful we are. Everyone knows that already. Uh, we are fully aware of our achievements and our accomplishments. What we are looking for at the moment is weakness. We are looking for our mistakes in order, if possible, to correct them. We are looking for the things we do not do well, the infirmities and misfortunes which burden us. These constitute our problems, and our problems represent achievements yet to be made, whereas our comforts and conveniences perhaps bear witness to the adjustments we have already accomplished. Therefore, let us say in this way that in astrology, each person born within a certain complex of time and place is endowed with conditioned energies. These energies represent an inheritance. And just as the individual may inherit means, or wealth, or property, or chattel, so he may inherit tendencies, qualities, attributes, aspects of character. Now when we think of inheriting, we think very largely, really, of the donation of our forebears, which may become the heaviest burden we have to carry. But our inheritance is also from space. Our inheritance is from some deep root of consciousness within ourselves which lies beyond the ordinary uh, gifts and legacies. We have all inherited a place and a time in existence. And in this place and time, we must work out the patterns of our own potential. In order to do this as effectively as possible, we must be aware that there are rules. We must know what we can about these rules. And we must try to apply them to the personal situations that affect ourselves. It is, of course, not unreasonable to assume that most persons know they live in a world governed by law. 
We are aware of this intellectually. Uh, we are not fully aware of it emotionally. And we are seldom aware of it when it interferes immediately with our ambitions or desires. Thus, although we accept certain principles, we do not apply them. We do not live according to the laws we recognize as real. We do not live according to the laws of God or of nature, and we resent rather heartily the laws of man. These resentments, this attempt, particularly on the part of certain modern uh, materialistic and anarchistic philosophies, this tendency to rebel against that which is proper, reasonable, and for man inevitable, is measured in terms of discomfort, in harmony and suffering. So we start with one rather simple and obvious rule, that if we are not a secure, happy, adjusted, and reasonably healthy person, there is room for improvement. Now this room for improvement is a challenge. And wherever the individual is not able to function in a reasonable manner, is not able to control his own instincts and appetites to a reasonable degree. Where we observe this lack of reasonable control, we know we are in the presence of the principal cause of trouble, and that the trouble will continue until this control is finally discovered, recognized, and applied. To control an energy is often difficult for the reason that the energy arises within ourselves. We are not able always to identify it. We are not able to tell when it will suddenly emerge. We are not able always to anticipate the pressures and tensions which will accompany it. Thus many of these experiences come upon us unawares, and before we realize what has happened, we have already made several unfortunate decisions. In the Western way of life, one of our reasons for trouble is our haste. We allow nothing to mature. We are not a contemplative people. We do not sit down quietly with ourselves. We do not have enough inner communion with our own natures to be able to say to our various pressures, be still. We are their victims. They come upon us while we are under other pressures. And in this complex of tensions, new elements are introduced so suddenly and sometimes so, sometimes so dramatically that we are unable to cope with them. One of the first problems then is to attempt to prevent the exceptional or extraordinary pressure from arising. We can do this usually uh, by permitting ourselves a greater degree of personal relaxation. Uh, relaxation does not mean laziness. It does not mean that the individual sits around with his hands folded, nor does it necessarily imply that he must get away somewhere into the mountains or the valleys and, and rest in the sun. Rest and relaxation are not identical things, although relaxation removes most of the need for rest as we know it. Actually, relaxation means to perform the various functions of life without tension, with a minimum of pressure. For the habit of pressure rapidly gets out of control. Once we become accustomed to doing things pressurefully, we lose the ability to do them graciously. Wherever pressure arises, there is danger. Just as the increasing pressure in a boiler may cause it to explode, so the increasing pr pressure in man's nervous system can cause illness. We observe today a constantly mounting pressure. The individual is responding more pressurefully to the circumstances around him than in any other time in history. To meet this requires a certain amount of conscious effort. We must resolve within ourselves to relax pressure, uh, to achieve what we can achieve without this tremendous sense of tension. We may feel that pressure hastens results, that without this pressure, things would take too long to happen. 
Actually, pressure does not hasten any constructive result. Uh, pressure puts too much tension upon the body. It puts too much wear and tear upon the nervous system. Uh, pressure is like whipping a horse carrying a heavy load. The horse may be able to struggle on more rapidly for a few feet, and then it drops dead. There is no solutional result to be gained by whipping the body, the mind, or the emotions in the effort to accomplish some particular unit of business or other activity. Some signs of the zodiac are more pressureful than others. Some reveal their pressures more immediately. Uh, some extrovert their pressures rapidly. Others build up a tremendous amount of internal tension. And this is perhaps the most dangerous that we have to face. Internal tension, however, is not limited entirely to a type of person. Internal tension is a defense that can arise in all types of individuals under certain types of intensity. Up to a period of, say, 50 years ago, your extrovert and your introvert were two very clearly distinguished groups. The extrovert was simply a natural person who exhibited his feelings intensely and obviously. The introvert was an individual who naturally concealed his feelings out of timidity, out of reticence, out of some form of humility or modesty, or perhaps more dramatically out of fear itself. Today, however, introversion is becoming an artificial habit in the lives of people originally untouched by it. We are all becoming more introverted because of the apparent hopelessness of the environmental situation. We find more and more difficulty in extroverting reasonably. It appears that we are living in a world moving so rapidly and under such tremendous compulsions that there is very little to be gained by coming out, saying anything, doing anything, or being anything. Thus, we have a tendency to fall back into introversion, even though we may not be what was originally termed an introverted type. Introversion may result from discouragement as to the ability of the individual to cope with any physical or environmental circumstance. Being hopeless and sensing helplessness the person may simply retire into himself, carrying a greater and greater amount of internal load, locked in a greater and greater degree of internal intensity. Obviously, the more this intensity builds up, the more dangerous it becomes. The more mechanically organized, uh, the more industrialized and standardized the culture becomes, the more difficult it is for the individual to find self-expression. Lack of self-expression contributes to frustration. Where the person can make a useful contribution to a way of life, he has every incentive to be useful. Where his uh, contribution is neither recognized nor accepted, he gradually becomes discouraged. Therefore, falls back into himself, building defenses or escapes according to his natural attributes. Today, our large defense mechanism, of course, is the magnitude of world affairs. Our escape is into trivia, into any form of unreasonable activity which seemingly gives relief for the moment. Thus, the boundary lines of types are not as clear as they used to be. More and more persons are involved in large patterns over which they cannot exercise adequate management. Uh, they are more and more victims of situations apparently beyond control. This requires an, a new ordering, a philosophic ordering of life. The ability of the person to recognize the dignity and significance of the integration of himself. That where we cannot change other things, we still have the privilege of improving self. We have a, a, an opportunity to learn rapidly the importance of a sufficient internal life, a life that is made rich without the necessity for visible attainments, a life that is purposeful even in a society which may not recognize the purposes with which we are most concerned. 
The result of a purposeful organization of ourselves is that we do become an increasingly powerful minority of integrated persons whose opinions, attitudes, and achievements are available to society when society is willing to accept them. And also, we have then a voice which we can use increasingly for the good of the group. Uh, we become less likely to be moved by propaganda and common prejudices. We are not so quickly affected by negative circumstances. And as a result, we do not panic. And where emotions of panic diminish in society, many of the mistakes of society will in this way be corrected. Even today, we observe the detrimental result of panic, a mania of masses, of groups of persons moved by propaganda or other forces to excesses not natural to them these situations must gradually be brought under control. Thus, uh, we have in astrology uh, not only a key to a world pattern, we also have a useful text for the integration of our own natures. And it is on this level that we wish to particularly approach the subject at this time. The person is able, if he so exercises his abilities and capacities, to direct his own life, uh, to correct those faults within him which are obviously contributing to his troubles, and also to develop new and positive values which will uh, contribute to new and positive solutions of problems. A problem person, to a degree at least, is an impoverished one. A person with problems is usually a person who has not much else but problem. He does not have an adequate allotment of values which are not problems. He is not able to turn from his problem thinking to other constructive, well-organized areas of mental emotional activity. Uh, working with people, I have observed that the person in trouble is usually a person who has not built much of anything but trouble. He has not recognized the possibility of a rich and valuable personal life. He has not given himself adequate mental and emotional outlets of a constructive nature. He is not interested in enough good to overcome the pressure of misfortune when it arises. Here we have the same problem that confronts the man retiring from business. If at the age of retirement he has not built sufficient interest, his health will most naturally decline. If, however, his retirement is a new door opening into a well-planned future, he is very likely to break the insurance statistics and collect his funds much longer than he would otherwise. Many persons have considered this an end in itself and have felt that the longer they lived, the more completely they revenged themselves against insurance probabilities. It's a rather negative approach, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> Each sign has uh, certain tensions or tendencies which may have an effect upon life. Now, we cannot go into all of the machinery of astrology at this time. We have to hope that you will have at least a broad concept of what we are talking about uh, without going into every harrowing detail. But we do know, for example, that the signs of the zodiac are divided into two groups, which are called positive and negative. Uh, the positive signs being those of odd number, the first, third, fifth, seventh, ninth, eleventh signs. The uh, negative or receptive signs are the even numbers, two, four, six, eight, ten, and twelve. Therefore, in working with people, we have observed that the positive signs constitute the easiest polarities for the male human being, and the negative signs, so-called, or passive signs, the best polarities 
for the feminine being. This means that actually positive and negative as, con as conceived in China were not to be termed uh, merely good and bad, but positive being uh, the sign of aggression or the outmoving of qualities and values, and the passive signs having more to do with the internal, intuitive, inspirational, emotional, psychical phases of experience. Therefore, a man who is born under a positive sign naturally receives a certain cooperation of energy. The sign is most appropriate to his obvious existence. A man, however, born under a negative or feminine sign has already here a certain type of conflict. Now this conflict may not be in any sense bad. Nature does not create bad. Nature, however, does demand more where it presents opportunities demanding greater adjustment. As in the case of the man, so with the woman. A woman born under a masculine sign or a positive sign has greater difficulty balancing her own femininity. And unfortunately, when either the masculine or the feminine polarities are off balance, this unbalance is not an attainment or achievement. It is a liability. It is a difficulty that has to be faced. In order to understand this situation then, we have to realize that the man who is hypersensitive, being born under a feminine sign, intuitional, more or less internal in his thinking, more or less positive in his emotional reflexes, subject therefore to a certain negativity of outward personality has greater difficulty getting along, either with men or with women. The woman on the opposite polarity, born under a masculine sign, presents more drive than is natural or normal to her kind, is less adaptable and adjustable, less able to complement someone else in marriage, less able to quickly and immediately assume the maternal role in motherhood, uh, less willing to permit her children to grow up, but continuing a positive dominant attitude over them. This type of woman may succeed better in business, but may pay for this achievement in terms of psychic peace of mind. Thus, wherever we have these cross polarities, we also have the beginning of a kind of tension. We have not anything wrong because actually the consciousness of man is androgen. The psychic life is both male and female. But when this psychic life moves through a body of the opposing polarities, the body and its pressures, its temperament and its tensions, uh, make it more difficult for that person to function harmoniously. Uh, the object intended is, of course, obvious. Nature is not so much interested in the happiness of means as it is in the dignity of ends. And therefore, nature is working for a very definite purpose, namely to gradually diminish these opposites, to cause the individuals involved to become more aware of the psychic polarities of each other. For it is only through these inner experiences that this mysterious interval between the sexes can ultimately be psychologically bridged. As long as the two polarities remain totally distinct, uh, they may harmonize a little better in physical activity, but their mutual understanding is not enriched. Nature is working for this enrichment, and therefore is constantly placing individuals in positions and conditions in which they become more and more aware of the function of opposite polarities this awareness arising within their own consciousness as a result of this situation that I have mentioned. So here we have one of our problems in psychology. The hypersensitive man and 
the materially, intellectually aggressive woman. Now, both of these uh, situations have tremendous values. Actually, your highly sensitive man has given us our world of arts in a very large degree. It was the sensitiveness of Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci or the great Raphael that was represented in the tremendous artistic achievement which these men uh, contributed to society. It is the mysterious, sensitive, almost maternal dedication to the needs of other persons that has transformed Albert Schweitzer into a world hero. If he had been a true, rugged, masculine intellectual, he would not have done what he did. On the uh, other side of the uh, ledger, we realize the tremendous contribution coming into society through the scientifically uh, trained woman, the philosophically trained woman, who is able to bring her emotional life into a more dominant place in world affairs, where the uh, uh, tremendous contribution of the psychic and intuitive polarities can become useful in the management of world uh, pressures and tensions. The uh, balance to be obtained is well worth the price. But in the transition, both types pass through growing pains, which are very uncomfortable, represented by confusion in character balance. Uh, this confusion uh, can also be largely helped if the individual understands himself better, understands the reasons for the experiences through which he is passing. Now, in a brief way, in the length of time that we have, we want to suggest certain general points to persons born under the different signs of the zodiac. Uh, we must remember, however, that we are not working from properly calculated nativities. Therefore, it is quite possible for any single individual to be an exception uh, to the patterns we point out. We do not expect these patterns to fill completely. We do not expect every individual to recognize himself in these patterns. But at the same time, uh, from a more or less empiric point of view, these patterns are still usually operating to some degree although this operation may be modified in any particular instance. The pressures themselves are classical. Uh, they are almost certain to appear in some way. And it often becomes helpful if the person, knowing himself better than anyone else can ever know him, uh, takes over certain keynotes and tries to explore his own personality to discover how these principles are operating in him. Instead of simply saying they are or they are not, it is better to estimate the degree to which they may be present in an effort to learn something that is useful to our own needs. We all have pressures or we would not be seeking knowledge. We are all to a measure insecure or we would not be questing in religion and philosophy for sources of personal integration. So there has to be some reason why we are in this world. And we are in this world largely because we are not quite good enough to leave it. And here we will remain until we improve the situation. The first of our zodiacal signs, of course, is Aries, extending approximately from the 20th of March to the 20th of April. Now we know that sometimes it's the 21st and sometimes it's the 22nd, but for round figures, uh, let us make some kind of a general uh, statement. And where you are born between the 18th and the 22nd or 3rd of a month, consider both the preceding and following suggestions, because they may be present to some degree as a compound. And persons under compound pressures of this nature also exhibit a new kind of mixed tensions, uh, which are often quite interesting uh, to the observer and not quite so interesting to the proud owner thereof. <laughs> Aries, I will in each instance indicate whether the sign be a masculine or feminine sign, as this may help in the person 
estimating from what we previously said concerning the mixed psychic pressures. Aries is a masculine sign and generally speaking is a sign which bestows a considerable amount of basic energy. There is probably no sign in which energy needs less definition. It is itself, it is a tremendous energy power. And one of the things that this energy likes to do in the Aries person is work. Uh, it's too bad we haven't more under the sign because there's a lot of the world's work that isn't getting done. But the Aries person is active. And uh, where this activity is frustrated or thwarted, where they are unable to be constructively busy, we begin to find a little psychic pressure mounting within them. Also, this sign is a lover of the open spaces for the most part. They like large areas of activity. Some Aries people will become very neurotic if nailed to a desk every day. They are most suitable for outdoor activities or activities carrying a maximum of variety and change. Uh, they like activity usually that is a combination of mental-physical activity. They do not like to do just mental work. They want to get their hands at something. Uh, they want to construct or to build. Nature has often endowed them with a pretty rugged constitution. And they, uh, they, like to, they like to be up and at it. An activity can sometimes get out of hand with these people. In their effort to be continually active, they may overstrain their resources, particularly as they grow older, for they find it difficult to adjust with limitations of strength or health. Normally speaking, without too much tension arising from conflict, uh, these people uh, hold their health and hold their energies rather better than a number of the other sides. Uh, they are often stronger and, and more enduring in older years than members of the other, than some of the other uh, astrological groups. Now Aries also has an interesting and wonderful ability uh, to retire into a kind of inner quietude. Uh, in the advanced Aries this means that the individual simply is able to build a rich inner life. With the less advanced type the Aries under tension is very apt to go to sleep. Uh, this uh, tension uh, this uh, tension does not, therefore, do the damage uh, that it might in a good many of the other signs. Very often these people can come, almost sleep standing up. I know one Aries who is uh, exceedingly adroit at this problem. They are able to sleep beautifully and peacefully while other people are talking to them. Now this is uh, uh, more or less of an achievement. And it is magnified in the one case I mentioned by the extraordinary fact that this person can sleep with a look of tremendous intelligence on their faces and with their eyes open. Now, unless they are suddenly addressed directly, no one even notices that they are asleep. This is very, a very helpful receptivity. Uh, many Aries persons have, by their peculiar strength, drawn to themselves heavy problems. They have drawn, drawn long-range loads to be carried. Some of these loads are pretty difficult, but the Aries person has a jaunty way of carrying them that is almost unbelievable. It is because in an emergency the Aries person can simply relax almost without trying. All this helps in many ways. Uh, but because of their natural activity in life, the sign is subject to accidents. It is subject to long, enduring difficulties arising from accident or injury. Uh, this may mean that it must carry with it through the years some at least minor physical problem that is not going to clear up entirely. Even so, this is carried with a, an amazing degree of fortitude. Uh, the people are patient but active. Uh, they are perfectly willing to permit energy to be used now at the same time 
they can and do project long-range plans. Uh, the Aries person is at a great disadvantage if they develop insomnia. Therefore, it is quite important for them to watch their sleep and to watch their ability to relax when they are not engaged in activity. These people need considerable sleep, and where they are denied it for too long a period of time, it will produce difficulty. Because of the natural allotment of energy in them, these people also become tremendously disturbed if this energy suddenly seems to diminish. The uh, Aries person is almost unable uh, to bear the experience of being tired. It seems to strike against them psychologically. They become a little panicky if they suddenly find they cannot do the things which they are accustomed to do. This is about their weakest point, and they have to work with it uh, as much as possible. Their largest and uh, happiest situation is where they can be pleasantly, constructively engaged in a variety of attitudes or works re requiring considerable physical activity. The uh, main psychological fear is that they have not really ever adjusted to sickness. And sickness, therefore, presents a little psychological emergency. They have not adjusted too well to age. Therefore, limitation of activity uh, must be met with a kind of quiet, contemplative courage. Uh, many Aries have sharp tempers and are quick-tempered, uh, but not generally given to grudges. But as they mature, the Aries person's temper becomes remarkably even, and as a result of that, their health remains uh, surprisingly good over a long period of time. They are in many instances an excellent example of how an energetic person uh, can at the same time conserve resources. There is not much tendency to waste energy. There is very little tendency to argument or discussion about things. But a simple direct doing of that which is next. And in this simple direct doing a wonderful conservation of resource. These persons should, however, uh, not worry too much, uh, not create negative imagination about health or circumstance, try to be as contemporary as possible, and uh, enjoy simple things every day. This is the way in which their health, their energies, can be best uh, sustained. They are not too involved. The Aries woman is somewhat more involved than the man, because her uh, energies are more like his, they are more active, they do things more, and in so uh, externalizing their energies, uh, they often get themselves into a position in which they can be accused of driving or dictating or attempting to dominate. Uh, thus, again, with them, achievement must be smoothed out, or else resistance will cause psychic stress. When people resist them, uh, they fight harder. Uh, the real secret of the problem is when someone resists, relax, and uh, in due course of time, try again. But if you fight through too hard, uh, you will waste energy, and no man today has energy to waste. From the 20th of April to the 20th of May, we have the Taurian person. And while they are generally represented as being bullheaded, this is not their real problem. Taurus is a feminine sign and presents greater difficulties to men than to women. By its very nature, uh, Taurus is imaginative. It is also down inside of itself rather easily frustrated. It is defeated uh, more quickly than some other signs. There are a lot of fears lurking in the background of the Taurian personality 
and they often come through in the form of an extraordinary appearance of aggressiveness which is not actually their real nature at all. There is an under, under stratum of melancholy. There is a tendency to fall into negative feelings. There is a tremendous psychic restlessness. Great difficulty in settling down to something. Uh, the, uh, the person uh, does not become a routine person too well and uh, they have a great many fears locked in their personalities. One of the common fears of Taurus has always been the fear of age. The Taurian person is a youth worshipper. Uh, they uh, are very much impressed by appearance. Uh, in a Taurian, a gray hair is a disaster and immediately you have to uh, treat it accordingly. I've watched the uh, gray-haired men with their first gray hairs appearing, Taurian men, sitting patiently pulling them out. <laughs> this, however, ultimately becomes a losing game. The, less, the, the least you can say is that you will lose all the hair. But these people are afraid of age. Not so much because uh, of its infirmities, but because of this tremendous, almost veneration for youthfulness and a complex about the mirror. There is, uh, there is uh, you know, the symbol of Venus, which rules Taurus, is a mirror. And the Taurian, looking in the mirror, gains from what he sees a considerable part of his daily psychology. Uh, this appearance must be optimistic and satisfactory, or the day does not go so well. The Taurian, therefore, needs to have a true philosophy of beauty, which the sign itself implies. It needs to recognize the beauty and dignity of youth, and also the beauty and dignity of maturity. It has to realize that beauty is not only youthfulness, but graciousness of consciousness, and that a beautifully lived life will result in a subtle, atmosphere of beauty accompanying the individual long after physical charms may have a tendency uh, to deteriorate. Consequently, uh, this problem of youth, life, beauty, freedom, uh, the development of imaginations beyond their normal uh, instincts, an overemphasis upon romantic and dramatic situations. These become the sources of psychic tension in these people. Where this psychic tension becomes too pressureful, we get uh, too much of a personality factor. We get the personality pushed forward uh, far beyond its natural uh, right and purpose. The individual becomes too dependent upon personality and not upon the principle behind this. Now when this strikes the man, we can have the vain man. We can have the egocentric individual, the man who becomes too much locked in the importance of his own personality. And uh, under some conditions, this may lead to a very aggressive dictatorial attitude or to a tremendous sense of defeatism or a neurotic tendency developing within the person. The problems are largely emotional. But uh, the answer to them always is the recognition that beauty is a therapeutic agent if we use it correctly. But it must be used correctly or it will not achieve its proper ends. Now the Gemini individual from the 20th of May to the 20th of June presents an entirely different type of psychological integration problem. Here we have a tremendous need for very simple self-discipline especially mental self-discipline. The individual must be taught the importance of straightening out his own thinking. This sign is a sort of psychic sponge. It takes into itself many ideas which are not meaningful. It permits completely conflicting attitudes to live together without attempting to discriminate between them. It causes the person to be too easily influenced by fads and notions and attitudes of those around them. It represents also a degree of hypercriticism, 
and the Gemini person loses the advantage of simple faith simply because they become too mentally involved. There is also a little tendency on the part of the Gemini individual to shy away from physical responsibilities. These people do not accept promotion in business as easily as some others, uh, nor do they uh, carry on with the same breadth of interests that are important to a healthy, happy adjustment. The tendency to be a little too scattered within an area. The individual may be scattered within a certain intellectual viewpoint. These people will run into political thinking of a minority kind. Uh, they will develop peculiar and extraordinary sympathies for the underprivileged. They will be leaders in socialization projects. Uh, they will be discomforted and pa paralyzed by news broadcasts. Uh, they will take on all kinds of negative fears. And the mind, instead of solving problems, will exaggerate them. Uh, I think probably one of the troubles here is just simply lack of a sufficiently colorful existence. Uh, these persons have not experienced widely enough uh, to be able to evaluate experience properly. They have lived within certain areas, social, uh, economic, political, cultural. They have never really peered over the fence to find out what is happening on the other side. Thus, there are many things around them all the time that bewilder them. Uh, I would say that for this type of person, an increase of breadth of interest, the development of various hobbies and avocational outlets, uh, a distinct effort not to be critical, uh, not to be bitter about anything, even that which is wrong. Because while we may know a thing is not good, the moment we become embittered about even evil, we begin to prepare our way for our own psychic undoing. What is not right, we know is not right. But if we personalize it, dramatize it, and emotionalize it, we will be sick. And this problem often results in the Gemini individual falling into a complex of nervous situations. It's very good for the... Uh, Gemini person to learn to sit down quietly and enjoy the good book, enjoy a pleasant conversation, and to enjoy sometimes small things of no great importance, uh, and not to become critical and feel that if they're not at this moment engaged in a cosmic enterprise, they are doing nothing. Uh, these people become very impatient with other folks and their small purposes. This is a very serious mistake because there will always be other folks and there will always be small purposes. And from perspective, maybe ours will be among the small purposes, although we do not believe it at the moment. From the 20th of June to the 20th of July, we have the cancer person. Oh, the cancer person reminds me of the American soldier in China who was looking at one of the dragons carved on the walls near the summer palace of the Empress Dowager a number of years ago. He took a look at this dragon and he said, my, these Chinese have the awfulest imaginations. <laughs> now, the cancer individual can sometimes have the awfulest imagination. The sign is highly imaginative and highly sensitive, and out of it can come a tremendous amount of creative artistry. The sign is feminine, and in the feminine nature, may often result in a very strong uh, maternal instinct, uh, a, a natural psychism, which can lead to a series of inner emotional experiences which may be over-accepted. The tendency of the, uh, the cancer person is to be extremely sympathetic of problem. At the same time, their own inner integration is not always up to their hopes and their beliefs and their convictions. The cancer person will very often try to do for someone else what they have never been able to do for themselves, and that is bring life into harmonious relationships. 
The cancer person, therefore, has to be constantly aware of the, delay, of the danger of internal emotional delusion. The things which they hold to be tremendously important may not be quite as valid as they think they are. That the tremendous tensions and pressures which they exert may not be justified. And that a, a great deal more could be accomplished easily and quietly and peacefully by simply relaxing and doing the things that can immediately be done. Uh, the cancer person is often very social conscious. Uh, that is not necessarily merely in small things, but in terms of social need. Uh, they would like to see a better world. They would like to see happier people. And very often uh, they overdo in the effort to bring these things about. The overdoing is not necessarily wrong, but it is wrong when the individual has not yet established his own footings adequately. Uh, the, the cancer person has not adequate establishment in themselves. Uh, they, are be they have become a little too dependent upon their own activity uh, for their own integration. The integration should cause the activity. They feel they will be happy if they forget themselves in their job. But they cannot forget themselves entirely in the job because the job is of themselves. And the situation becomes sometimes rather complicated. As a result of tremendous emotional intensity, uh, very often, almost always, frustrated to some degree by its own intensity, these people are often disillusioned or embittered or settle down to a long period of acceptance of what to them may appear to be a dismal state of affairs. If they could uh, realize that much that they believe to be very certain only originates in their own moods, they will be happier and able to face the situations more effectively. It is a sign in which the person is too easily pressed by unknown intensities of emotion within himself. And these pressures nearly always cause him to overlook the need to integrate his own nature. Where this happens, you have the danger of uh, particularly digestive problems. You have difficulty in elimination, quite frequently appearing. You have a uh, tremendous tendency to fall into fads, to fall into various intensities the individual feeling that an intensity means a value, and this is not always the case. In the cancer man, we find again the artistic, sensitive, psychic, emotional factors making it difficult for him to adjust in society. He always apparently uh, has to have some employment or some activity which gives opportunity for creative emotional expression. Uh, this emotional intensity uh, detracts to a measure from his solid industrial adjustment. From the 20th of July to the 20th of August, we have Leo. Now, Leo are people usually who obviously or quietly set about something and generally stay with it until they feel that it is accomplished. It is a go do it and stay with it type of situation. Now, the sign is essentially masculine and Leo people divide into two distinct parts or types, one of which is quite the Rora, the individual with the strong Leonine executive pressure, and the other we might term an intimidated Leo. The intimidated Leo is actually one who has the Leo qualities but with a very highly sublimated consciousness. Uh, this consciousness causes the person uh, to turn his willpower largely to the control and directing of his own life. Uh, under such conditions you have the mystic, the educator, the idealist. Uh, where the Leo person is more aggressive, you have the leader and even the dictator. You have the strongly arrogant type of Leo. Now the uh, great virtue of the Leo person is their sincere and dedicated uh, sense of responsibility. They are faithful unto death of the things that they believe, and they are very excellent servants of good causes. The uh, danger to them, of course, in their activity 
is an extremism. Uh, they are not quite flexible enough. They are not quite able to find the humorous side of life. Things get a little too serious. Problems are exaggerated to some degree. And in the quiet side of Leo, dedication has even led to martyrdom. It is a sign in which the person uh, to be really uh, as happy as they can be and as well adjusted as possible must develop just a little more sense of humor, must, re must recognize that they are working with a world that is not going to do quite the way they think it should, and uh, take a rather parental attitude of leadership without domination, of helpfulness without criticism, and of cooperation without a determination to run something. All these things have to be very quietly worked out in the Leo. The moment a Leo person tries to dominate situations, he creates tremendous resistance. His very nature seems to do this, and as a result he has pain and troubles that otherwise he should not be forced to endure. The Leo woman is a very dedicated person, and uh, Leo women in families are often uh, the dedicated uh, co-worker in a project. Uh, the Leo person, Leo woman, inheriting uh, a husband or family responsibility will carry it with great conscientiousness. Also, they will remember uh, persons whom they have admired. They are hero worshippers, and they are particularly dedicated to the perpetuation of the work of the dead, particularly some close person, leader, or object of respect in their lives. They will continue a continuing allegiance to that over a period of years. Many organizations pass into the control of Leo women who become devout and wonderful preservers of the trust that has been given to them. This is the way in which they work out uh, their feminine approach. They become world motherly rather than simply personal parents. The Leo person, uh, because of their pressures, has some enemies, has some opponents, is open to criticism, and where this gathers too much momentum may result in sickness. They are subject to falls, dizzy spells, and injuries of a minor nature involving the heart. They are sometimes subject in, in older years to difficulty in locomotion, but uh, for the most part they get along fairly well if they are able to sort of graciously warm up their programs so that they do not appear to be merely forcing situations. From the 20th of August to the 20th of September is the Virgo person, which is a feminine sign, and the Virgo individual, generally speaking, is also rather the nervous type, uh, more or less introverted by nature, very often successful in forms of humanitarian enterprise, especially involving health as doctors, nurses, therapists, and persons of that nature. They have a great love of helping the sick. Very often Virgo persons, by their natures, being somewhat negative, have a tendency to draw things to them, and they draw problems. They have a magnetic fascination about them, uh, which causes persons weaker or more helpless to move in. This situation often throws the Virgo person into a long-range responsibility program, a program of taking care of, helping, guiding, leading, directing, sustaining, supporting, and holding up somebody. This can become more or less tiresome, and uh, as a result of it, uh, the uh, Virgo individual uh, becomes a little negative, a little disillusioned, uh, a bit pathetic sometimes, and uh, gets a sort of internal feeling that they are being well imposed upon. I have news for them. They are. <laughs> but at the same time, I've known cases where things were done to put it right, and the Virgo person was utterly miserable because uh, he just couldn't get along except when he was imposed upon. Those were his best moments. Well, if he can handle it without getting sick or getting uh, irritable, nervous, or troubled, all right. 
but the tendency is for them to absorb into themselves these problems and then spread the problems in the area of their own activity. Uh, the Virgo physician has to be careful that he doesn't discover in many of his patients some particular ailment with which he is peculiarly interested. He has a tendency to sort of pass on these things in this way. Virgo persons, being by nature nervous, being by nature perhaps a little unable to control uh, their tendency to sort of chatter along their way of life, should cultivate again uh, as much philosophy as possible, deep values with which to balance uh, mental pressures, and, and a very broad, tolerant, kindly, relaxed relationship with life. Otherwise, you're going to find too many nervous ailments appearing, uh, too much tendency to fatigue, and uh, a little negative melancholy slowly creeping in to color the life uh, rather uh, drably. They mustn't reach the situation in which they must be busy every minute or miserable. There must be a way of not uh, being quite so busy and at the same time being happy, uh, pleasant, and integrated, and adjusted. By this uh, procedure, all things go a little better. The Virgo man, because of the uh, negative endowment which he has received, is apt to be lacking in a necessary degree of aggressiveness for family leadership or for advancement in business, and he is apt to be engaged in some line of activity uh, which does not demand too much creative imagination. Therefore, he needs creative imagination rather than routine to enrich and perfect his life. From the 20th of September to the 20th of October, we have the Libra person. And the Libra individual is one in whom frustrations very often have almost immediate results. Uh, the frustration being pressure, the Libra person being a very willful person, uh, being a person with tremendous determinations, and to a certain degree uh, an instinctive tendency to try to aggressively influence other people, must learn that all of this procedure will shorten life and shorten happiness and will result in serious uh, detriment to the various metabolic processes of the body. The person who is too dominant, too uh, aggressive, has metabolism troubles. And these, in turn, can lead to many other situations. So that the libra person must let down the drive by means of which they are pressed to either supreme achievement or nothing. Uh, this perfectionism of the libra person, uh, this absolute requirement that they be in some way important may cause this importance uh, to be attempted by force rather than by merit. The only way in which the Libra person can achieve the high degree of recognition which they really desire is by having the kind of nature, the kind of personality, and the kind of attainments by which this approbation would naturally come to them. If it is not obvious and they try to force it, they lose friends, they create for themselves isolation and bring a great deal of unnecessary criticism upon their own heads. Therefore, the problem of Libra is this problem of building firm merits under a very deep, broad understanding of life. And as this understanding increases, the tendency to dogmatize decreases. It is too much pressure, too much willfulness that brings psychological sickness to these people, and it's the relaxation of willfulness that must, in a turn, bring them back again to peace and security. Uh, the Libra woman has the tendency, often, to resent her own femininity and to wish she was a man or able to carry men's work. Uh, this situation isn't essentially good because it becomes the basis of a neurotic tendency. Uh, instead of this attitude, it's far better for her to engage in some uh, rather definite pursuit and to build a career in which she has a reasonable degree of extroversion. 
Uh, it's not good to build anything upon resentment, only upon accomplishment, everywhere along the way through life. From the 20th of October to the 20th of November, we have the feminine sign of Scorpio. This sign, again, is one of our intensity pattern signs. It comes with a great deal of uncontrolled drive. I think the Scorpio person of all the uh, signs is the one most likely ultimately to become afraid of themselves. They do not understand the pressures that are in them. Probably most of them will rationalize the pressure in somewhat this way, namely that along the way of life there was something they always wanted to be. Situations made it almost impossible for them to be this thing. Therefore there is a defeatism in there. There is a sense uh, that this life has closed its doors on them and that they have been forced into situations that are not fruitful of true fulfillment. These people uh, must always have some creative emotional outlet because if their emotions go sour, they are in a very bad way. To keep their emotions from going sour, they must not be critical of other people. Uh, they must be as gentle and optimistic as possible and uh, make a disciplined program of surrounding their lives with interests by which they become closer to other people. The tendency of the Scorpio may be to evade social contact or avoid it as uninteresting or unprofitable or too difficult. But social contact is one way to keep the Scorpio person reasonably normal. They are in great need to be able to mingle easily with other people and to recover from a dramatic tendency toward self-consciousness. This self-consciousness is not good. It leads to physical problem uh, and very often these individuals suffer from unusual tensions uh, involving the spine and involving the sensory perceptions and they frequently have trouble with their eyes. So this sign uh, in order to to gain its adjustment in life must uh, get away from a certain self-centered focusing by means of which they become shy or un, so unadjusted socially. Uh, they must be able to relax and find for this drive that they have within themselves, which is almost a blind drive, they must have for it a variety of useful, happy, well-adjusted outlets. And the best outlets for them must be in creative fields, in creative arts, self-expression, or production of self-created artistry or craft work. Their best work is in creativity, which is generally denied to them in their ordinary vocational activity. Creativity for them is the most important phase of their lives. This sign, incidentally, carries almost the same recommendation for the ladies. It is, again, creativity uh, escaping from pattern or drudgery or order or rhythms which become boresome. Every uh, Scorpio woman must have some psychological outlet that is interesting. And if they haven't found what is interesting, they must realize that it is because they have not been interested. And to be interesting, things must awaken interest in us. But there are many things, particularly of a more serious and important nature, which Scorpio people can find to be extremely interesting. From the 20th of November to the 20th of December, we have the Sagittarian. And the Sagittarian is often one with too many interests. Uh, a, a very uh, interesting, rather pleasant personality is very marked in, these, in this sign. Uh, but it is also one which is distinguished both in men and women uh, for lack of, we might say, self-control. Uh, this sign has to look out for the misuse of escape mechanisms. The individuals born under it must not run away from facts. The tendency is to obscure facts 
to hide them in one way or another and to develop surface projects which are not consistent with inner convictions. This leads also to one of the great dangers of the sign, namely intemperance. And in many cases, uh, the alcoholic problem has ruined the life of a Sagittarian. But if this forms one kind of habit, we know there are many other habits quite socially acceptable that can also have a detrimental effect. And uh, one of the problems with the Sagittarian is the danger of developing a success fixation. The importance of succeeding, the status symbolism, these things uh, very often uh, must be considered. Also, the temperament of the Sagittarian, particularly the Sagittarian woman, often gravitates against a successful marriage. And as a result of being a little too critical, a little too demanding, and perhaps a little too extravagant, the Sagittarian woman has got to guard her home, or something may go wrong in it. The tendency also, finally, with the Sagittarian person is to live through an adventurousness into a final state of more or less quiet security. In the uh, uh, long range of things, the Sagittarian often comes to a very happy and fortunate situation. But they have to come to that after they have exhausted a series of false situations with false glamour. The earlier, therefore, that the Sagittarian can discriminate real value from appearance and can turn from appearance to value, the sooner they can do this, the more quickly they will avoid uh, the pressures and tendencies which affect the sign. The sign is affected by surgery. Usually there is at least one major surgery or danger of it. Uh, the sign is affected uh, to a measure at least uh, by uh, fears, negative fears, and by defeatism, and often by a pattern of life in which the individual has sacrificed too much in the vain effort to try and succeed. Uh, the merit system must be strong, the person must be relaxed, and uh, the effort to succeed must never reach a point of compromise. If we compromise with principles, the Sagittarian does not do well. Religion frequently becomes a strong factor in bringing the Sagittarian person to final integration. Now the next sign is Capricorn from the 20th of December to the 20th of January. This sign has as its principal adversary in terms of psychology and health a certain setness or fixedness of attitude. It is present in both the men and the women of the sign this sign there is not a great deal of inconsistency between the two except that strangely enough the women seem to appear the more ambitious of the two uh, in this particular group the uh, Capricornian person has to be careful not to become set in ways for anything that becomes set becomes crystallized the Capricornian cannot afford to settle down into any attitude or condition or even into a place which will have a tendency to close in upon them. Everything closes in on them if they are not careful. This closing in restricts perspective, restricts opportunities and privileges, and gradually causes the individual to develop physical tendencies uh, of uh, crystallization, rheumatic problems and uh, chronic difficulties arising from chronic attitudes. Now from the 20th of January to the 20th of February we have the Aquarian folks and here again we have a nerve tension problem. Uh, we find that in this particular sign although it is masculine that the ladies have a better adjustment frequently than the men. The Aquarian uh, woman is uh, inclined to be vivacious attractive, personable. She also has a bright and sparkling type of nature which is not always the result of having had an easy life because many of these people carry quite a good deal of tragedy in their inner consciousness. But they rise above it rather dramatically and for the most part spend their lives in a sincere effort to try to work out constructive ways of using their energies. Uh, they're quite uh, the organizers, they're quite the 
uh, inspirers of the people around them. The Aquarian man is also, uh, along somewhat more scientific lines, inventive and creative. In almost any field of activity, however, he is apt to be a little critical because his mind works quickly and he is apt to outthink the boss, which can be a serious mistake in business. He can also uh, have a certain kind of honesty, which is easily hurt and afflicted. He does not like to compromise his principles for any reason. This can also be a financial hazard at the present time. Actually, the Aquarian is best uh, suited to some form of individual business or in a field activity in which he has very little contact uh, with the politics of the organization in which he is involved. He has a natural dislike for politics, a critical attitude towards the machinery of management, and prefers to be on his own. This is for one of two reasons, either because of principle or because he is not able to control himself. Now, if it is due to the later, uh, to the latter of these two, if it is simply unwillingness to be disciplined, he should put himself in a position where discipline is inevitable. But if it is simply because of real conviction that, that discipline in this case represents compromise of principle, then, of course, it is his right and his proper duty uh, to remain true to principles. Uh, it's a, an analysis of himself to determine whether he is using his principles or merely making evaders out of them. And the last sign is our old friend the fishes, Pisces, from the 20th of February to the 20th of March, a feminine sign. Now in this case, the feminine sign has not been too kind to the women that are born under it, because it has given them also a very powerful imagination with a tendency to be somewhat morbid or self-pitying. Uh, the internal life of the Piscean woman is too likely to be lived in the past to perpetuate grievances, grudges, and misfortunes, and to be unable to completely extricate from self-centeredness. The Piscean woman needs to get her mind on other people so completely that she can't even remember that she's ever had troubles. She doesn't have to remember them because she knows she's had them anyway, that she's never going to totally forget but it is better never to bring them into an immediate situation. Don't make the mistake of when someone tells you their trouble of reminding them of yours. This is not going to help, but it is a tendency. There is a tendency also for uh, things that happened in childhood and long ago to sort of come out and overshadow. The tendency of the past or that which is gone to rule the living. This tendency should be coped with and every effort made to give it greater vitality. The Piscean woman probably needs more education, more activity, more professional work life than the majority of the other signs. She needs a, a definite area of public service if she can possibly attain to it. The Piscean man is very often the clergyman or the psychologist or the doctor or something of that nature. He is inclined to be uh, as it is a feminine sign, he is inclined to be passive, introverted, imaginative, and creative within his own fields. With him, however, the energy problem becomes more or less continuously acute through life. His energies do not sustain him. And one of the, his ailments, uh, as a result of his uh, lack of energy and not too robust health, will often involve circulation, nervousness, uh, fatigue, and uh, diminution of the sensory perceptions and faculties against these which are more or less uh, indications of low voltage within his uh, electric field he must use what means he can to increase his energies but mostly to decrease his waste in their use he gets by by saving carefully what he has and wasting none of it on pursuits which may be perfectly practical for other people, but are a luxury which he cannot afford. Now our time is more than up. We tried to carry you around the circle with a few remarks, and we hope that you will find something that will be helpful, and if you don't, that you won't blame me for misjudging you completely. We'll do the best we can, anyway. <laughs>
slight change in the program, make some announcements first. It's best usually to do it that way, otherwise it's the confusion when people start getting up to leave and so forth. The first announcement I'd like to make is connected with this afternoon's uh, uh, adventure here. Turn off the microphone. No mic? For the recording. Yes, it's on. Okay, we're ready. Okay. We'll start again then. This uh, morning I'm going to enact, make some announcements. You know, there's going to be a special musical event in the library this afternoon, and all of those contributing their talent have been long friends of the society. Uh, most of them have been professionals, and we believe we'll have a pleasant afternoon. And the uh, benefits from it will go to the advancement of the publication program of our society. So we hope that you will be present, if possible. I also like to make an announcement to the effect that a few weeks ago, my wife and I made a, t a tape in connection with the dinner to the advancement of her work. The number of people have asked for this tape in which I give a short talk on Bacon, and she on the work of the Baconian idea in American life and government. And we have a few of these which are available. People have asked for them. They can be secured through the gift shop or ordered through the gift shop. Many people have asked to secure copies of this particular tape. In connection with our recent book on uh, alchemy, which has just been published, I have a rather nice announcement I can make, which I think is a good sign in the right direction, namely that among the first to order the book was the Smithsonian Institution. And the second order, a few days later, came from the Bodleian Library at Oxford. Now, how either of them knew about it, we don't know, but it looks as though it's getting around. So this morning we have a nice problem uh, in the effort to find ways of reducing uh, the human equation in, in uh, health, where it is damaged by attitudes or by uh, negative thinking or by the pressure of problems. Uh, long ago, Plato made the statement that all forms of government are satisfactory, suitable, and proper if they are honestly administered, that if the best rule and the rest obey, we have a proper commonwealth. He said that a good king was better than a, a bad dictator, and a, a good dictator better than a bad uh, politician. All of these things are already summed up to integrity. Now, the Neoplatonists took this problem a little further, namely that the only ultimate, ultimate government that is going to solve our problems is self-government. We are going to have to do it for ourselves. And it is good to notice that this time particularly, that all over the country and in many parts of the world outside of this area, efforts are being made for in, for, by individuals to do things for themselves, to correct the mistakes of leadership, to repair the damage of selfishness, and to overcome the consequences of ignorance. These processes are very encouraging. In fact, it's probably true to say that the present moment is one of the best that we've gone through in a long time, although to most people it is maybe one of the worst. 
It is the best because at last more and more people are beginning to think. They are beginning to realize that legislation will not result in integrity. Integrity comes with the individual himself. And after a while, we not only find the people ruling themselves, but the person ruling himself. The directives for such rulership, of course, arise from personal experience, from tradition, from the spiritual institutions of mankind, from the ancient philosophies, arts, and sciences, but most of all, from an interpretation of these values by means of which they become part of a strong moral perspective on life. Now, when we come down to the individual, we find his condition very much mirrors the social situation of today. The society in which we live is seriously disturbed, and this disturbance is reflected in the attitudes of people. <clears throat> more and more, the individual is taking on the negative values, or lack of them, which are bothering us today. And out of all this comes fear, anxiety, uh, objection, uh, even violence. And all of these excesses react into the human being himself. I think the Oriental attitude was probably the best available. Namely, that the great problem is the individual learning to smooth out his own conduct, to find ways in which he can overcome or transmute the pressures which disturb him. One way, of course, of accomplishing this is to realize the reason why we are in trouble. To realize that we're in trouble because it is the only way in which the individual can be lured from his own mistakes. We are in trouble because we deserve them. All the troubles that we have are part of a, what the Oriental calls a karmic load. Now, karma is not a fatal punishment. Karma is simply the fact that when you do it wrong, we must be corrected. When we make a mistake, we must find for certain that we have made a mistake. And most of all, we must stop blaming our mistakes on other people. Most persons today will feel or say that they would be happy if it wasn't for something someone else was doing. Well, each of us has to finally realize that we cannot prevent what someone else is doing. But we can transmute the entire circumstance so that can no longer damage ourselves. It does not mean that we have to accept the mistakes of others, but it does mean that we must try to understand them and find how to adapt the knowledge we gain from experience to the preservation of our own well-being. Health problems today uh, are perhaps more serious than ever before. In spite of the nu numerous advancements in science, in spite of infinite research and continuous development of remedial agencies, the public health is not good. The public health is bad because of the tensions and stresses by which the person is influenced. In religion for a long time, uh, we had a strong line of defense against this. The individual, regardless of what church or faith he belonged to, tried to live what he claimed to believe. He tried to prove to himself and others that he was under the leadership of a spiritual integrity. When he read in the New Testament uh, that Jesus admonished us all to be brethren, to unite in common cooperation, he tried to do this. But today, this type of thing is no longer a, as meaningful as it should be. We, are, we know that we should not be cruel, that we should not be selfish, that we should not uh, uh, kill or destroy. These things we accept upon the basis of our religious convictions. 
and about three quarters of the Earth's populations have convictions to this effect. Yet never before has there been more war and disturbance. And in the individual life, never more ha before has there been so much pressure, so many frustrated ambitions, and so many mistakes carefully and lovingly nourished. The, uh, the situation, therefore, is that our religion is not at this time serving as an actual preventive of disorders. When we uh, claim to be a Christian, the theory is that we shall obey the teachings of Christ. The acceptance of the fact that they are good is of very little practical value unless this acceptance involves our definite dedication to fulfilling these uh, statements. If we do really believe that we should love one another, then the fact that we are baptized or converted into a certain faith does not permit us to keep on disliking everybody in the name of God. We do not have the right to claim a religion that we do not practice. And we do not practice a religion unless it does something to change us for the better. Therefore, we have all over the world devout religious people who are not getting any better. In fact, they are getting a little worse. They're using their religion as a very powerful defense, and for their religion they are willing to die. But for their religion they are not willing to live. And this is a very sad state of affairs. But out of it comes the inev inevitable conclusion that the religion was the more important factor. No matter what we claim to believe, we are what we do. We are the standard of living by which we seek to face the problems of life. Actually, the temptations that affect, affect us and burden us today are largely personal selfishness, grudges, and all kinds of negative attitudes that have no justification in any religion or philosophy worthwhile. Yet we do not have the skill or the wisdom or the strength to live what we believe. Back in the days when my esteemed grandmother was growing up, the problem was much simpler. She came from Massachusetts and uh, was brought up in, in the mystical atmosphere of the New England Transcendentalists. These uh, rather gentle people, like Thoreau and Emerson, had a very simple way of life, but they kept it. In the community in which she grew up, Haverhill, Massachusetts, uh, people did not have to fight their neighbors to maintain their integrity. The neighbor had the same integrity as themselves. The individual who was uncomfortable was the one who failed to live the level of the integrities of the community. At that time, people were naturally inclined to be kind. They went to church, they tried to practice what they heard, and they also served each other in a thousand gentle and kindly ways. All this has been changed. Today the individual finds very little support from his personal environment. His friends, his relatives, his neighbors are all under the same pressures as himself, and they are all living to compromise their conduct to meet the advantages of profit. All this type of thing makes the person more alone. Instead of society supporting him, he now has to support society. Instead of being controlled, directed, and inspired by reasonable conduct around him, he is forced to try and maintain some kind of a reasonable conduct in the face of constant pressure. Out of this constant pressure comes a negative psychology. The individual gradually undermines his own life. He becomes more and more aware of the delinquencies of the time. He becomes more and more frustrated and unable to cope with a situation which he should never have been expected to face. This business of trying to make people of moderate integrity face incredible temptations is not reasonable or right. 
But it is so. It is the way it is. And each person has to either expect to follow the general pattern and suffer with the rest, or else he must attempt to live his own life constructively and let some of the others work it out for themselves. It is almost useless to try to convert other people. The individual who is susceptible to conversion generally is already well on the way to a better life. Those who do not agree, we can't do very much about. Conformity is not what we desire. We cannot solve this problem by all joining the same church. We cannot form it or answer it by having all people vote for the same candidates. The problem lies in the individual working out the reason why he does not feel good at this time. If he has headaches, backaches, and all kinds of symptoms which arise from the vagueness of his own attitudes, there is no way that health can be improved unless the individual recognizes the therapy of his own personal integrity. Until he is, accepts this and understands it, he is going to suffer from a series of vague conditions, conditions of worry, anxiety, argumentativeness. He is going to look in the newspaper and see nothing but the trouble. He is going to listen to the television and become more discontented and feel less able to cope. All of these things have to be handled by the person himself. But this was the reason he was put here in the first place. The individual was not put here to lean back and let someone else save him. We are here as a creation of creatures, and we have to work out our own salvation with diligence. We have to recognize that we are here to grow and not simply to have fun, because if we do not grow, there will be nothing in the, la in the last analysis that is either funny or enjoyable. We are here to improve ourselves, correct our own mistakes, help where we can, and stand strong against the temptations to negative attitudes which so many people suffer from today. Even if we are successful in this, however, we will not be able to completely dispense with psychology or psychiatry. We will still need them. But we will get rid of the individual who is simply making himself sick by his own wrong approaches to life. Now we are all reading the newspapers and uh, we are seeing the dismal situation that is developing. We are also observing a certain note of desperation arising in the upper echelons of human society. We are realizing that nations and communities, vast areas and small areas, are uh, beginning to recognize that the change must be made by the individual, that we must grow. We can never pay any politician enough money so that he can grow for us. We have to do it ourselves. And the more pressure we have, the more we will be tempted to do it right. In the old days, when temptations were low and uh, not too many of them, any definite minor variety of breakaway from normalcy was considered uh, forgivable and forgettable. Today this is no longer the case. Today the problem must be faced directly. We have people all the time who are worried, and we have people all the time who are going more and more into a negative reaction. And we also have another large group of people enlarging considerably that are rushing around in one direction or another for a panacea for all this. They are trying to find some way of getting out of trouble without changing themselves. Or that they can get on a boat that is going somewhere, but they are not the captain. This also is a very dismal failure. There is simply no way in which somebody else can make us strong unless we are willing to try. There's no way that we can find a philosophy of life that is adequate to our needs unless we are willing to live it. There's no, no longer any way in which we can join our way into security. We have to do it ourselves. With this in mind, then there's a 
few recommendations that might be useful to us at this time. The first place we should add up and search out the situation we're in. Find out what kind of attitudes we have in general. Are we by nature optimistic or by nature pessimistic? When I say optimistic, I mean is there a deep abiding hope that is available under pressure and stress? Or are we those who are just waiting for the worst to get a little worser? Are we waiting every day for more bad news? And when it comes, sit back in a sad smile and say, I knew it. <laughs> we, are we really uh, people who want to do something? Or are we overwhelmed by the negation of things and decided that there's no hope? Well, there is always hope, and nature is so constituted that when an individual gets rid of all hopes, then nature slowly eliminates him and gives him a new chance later to improve his attitudes. But the world will not redeem itself or peace will not descend upon us until the world itself unites in an effort to achieve it. And in this effort to achieve it, all good progress begins with the individual. Enough individuals make a certain move or assume a certain fact society changes. It is not changed from the top, really. It is changed from the common average person who is the most uncommon and miraculous of all creatures. If you have the tendency, therefore, to expect the worst, this you should start to work on as quickly as possible. I know people who have found a one very simple cure for much of this. They have done it by a kind of retrospection, always expecting the worst. It has been suggested to some of them that they sit down quietly and re look back over their own lives for over a period of years and find out just exactly what did happen to them. Uh, is this knowing of despair and despondency the, really the result of a tragic life or has it been simply an attitude which has chosen to ignore all good things and cling unto the ills? Can anyone really look back over a lifetime and not find many things that happened to them that were beautiful, helpful, constructive, and useful? Can we all look back over a period of time and find no friend who was ever any good? Or, and if we did find this situation, have we really analyzed why? If we are friendless, is it because we have never been a friend rather than never had one? If we are friendless, have we had one or two disappointments and then turned against the whole world? Also, if we look through this background, we may find a great many things that can be capitalized in terms of progress. We can learn to value the experiences we have had. We can discover what happened when we were over gullible. We can find what happened when we lost our temper and made a bad situation worse. We can find out when we were cheated and maybe discover in the quietude of our own lives that that happened because we wanted something that wasn't right or reasonable in the first place. All of these types of reflections will help us to find out what kind of a background in our lives could be held responsible for our present attitudes. Now, there probably will be a tragedy or two all the way along. There will never be a time when things do not at least occasionally go wrong. But looking back over a period of 40, 50, 60, 70 years, it would seem that we should, re we should find that we are reading a book, a biography or an autobiography, and that up to a certain point we have always made this book unreliable. We have always emphasized what has been done to us and not what we did to them. We have always taken the joy out of our own lives and then blamed someone else for it. 
But out of this careful reconsideration of our own conduct, we may very often find a new textbook, a new way of looking at things that can be tremendously helpful. Now this is the reason for history on the larger scale of things. Today we are looking around and we see mostly history of war and pillage, and we look back upon war and pillage to the beginning when cave people threw stones at each other. But we have also done some very wonderful things which we lose sight of. We lose sight of the tremendous progresses that we have made in a great many fields of action. We realize what has happened in health, for example, that the average length of life back 2,000 years was around 30 years of life. Finally, we got it up in the 10th, 12th, and 11th century to 35 years. In the 18th and 17th centuries, we got it close to 60. Now the records give us more than 70, and it is increasing all the time. Many great diseases have been curbed. Many types of misunderstanding have been smoothed out. We are beginning to be interested in diet, nutrition, all of these things, all of which have old foundations but have been generally ignored. Those who ignore the lessons of the past most quickly are the ones who have the most powerful opportunities and privileges at the present time. It's useless, however, to assume that we are successful because of a wealth which permits us to die of gluttony. These things have to be measured, but in measuring them we can also measure what philosophy has done for us, and we can observe the slow decline of it, how year after year, century after century, human stupidity and avarice has gradually blocked the course of normal mentation. We can see time after time how virtue was sacrificed to ambition, and little by little we can see the consequences of it. We see one empire after another go down. We find one civilization after another fail, almost always because of corruption. Nearly always we realize something that architecture has taught us, namely, the history is a continuing account of lost ground. The longer we go back, the better it was. The more we come forward, the worse it gets on the grounds, of course, that greater opportunity to be better today than was ever available before, as it made it possible for us to be worse. Now, out of this, we have the people with uh, various ailments. Now, actually, the ancients had quite a good idea of what was wrong with sick people. One of the uh, most uh, interesting of the older healers was Hippocrates of Kos. And he uh, was the one who created what we call today the clinic. He was the first one to make a systematic study of the causes of disease. Also in Egypt, there was a priest who lived about a thousand years B.C. who did a work on the study of human health and uh, wrote, left behind him a papyrus, the medical papyrus that uh, was... Uh, translated and brought into uh, popular circulation only a few years ago. This old document uh, describes ailments, how to treat them, what to do with them. But Hippocrates perhaps was the most successful. When they came to him sick, uh, they gathered in the chapel of Asclepius, the god of healing, a great figure standing uh, with a coiled serpent around a staff, which was a symbol of medicine, and the dog crouching at his feet, the symbol of the service of mankind. And when they got there, the sick people were put on cots and told to sleep for the, the first night in the temple. And they were to record the dreams that they had, or any experiences or memories that came to them which were dominant and treasureful. And in the morning, the physicians analyzed these reports and upon this basis accomplished a great deal in the correction of human illness. The dream psychology told uh, Hippocrates the secret attitudes of the people. 
and where these secret attitudes were bad, help had to suffer. So that the help was not necessarily merely in the dosing of the sick. It was in the cultivating of a proper relationship between the individual, the world in which he lived, and the divine power that governs it. Hippocrates was among the first to point out that all healing actually and inevitably comes from God. The physician is merely the servant of deity. What the deity proclaims and decrees the, serf the servant can fulfill. And Hippocrates was very certain that God gave his best help to those who most deserved it, and that he was the one that decided who deserved it. And this desert was deserving was dependent upon character and conduct. So Hippocrates said in many instances that it was necessary for the person to change his ways. And this is always a stumbling block. We will change anything except our ways. <laughs> we will do anything we're expected to do as long as it doesn't change anything that we're doing now. <laughs> we see this in the narcotics problem. You see it in alcoholism. You see it where legislators get out and defend the right of the individual to get drunk. We want better laws, but they must not interfere with what people want to do. And if people want to destroy themselves, we should never create laws to prevent this. And if we do create laws, they are almost impossible to enforce, because the person is determined to do what he pleases. And the only final answer, as philosophy has pointed out, is that we, he must come to the point where he pleases to do that which is right. This is the only answer to most of the physical and emotional disorders of mankind. We cannot say to the individual successfully that he must do that which he will not willingly do. Perhaps we can force him to do it. We may be able to restrict him so that he has no choice but to do it. But when this happens, he becomes neurotic. Because the neurotic is when a person who can't do what he wants to do because he shouldn't. And this combination is almost beyond conflict. We can do very little about it. But we must try to find ways in which the person desires to do that which is best. Now, several circumstances uh, come into that. Uh, the individual who is desperately ill and is uncertain about his survival very often has quite a streak of virtue appear in his nature. He is willing to do almost anything to get well. If the doctor tells him that he's got to change his diet, he'll promise. If he has told that he has a def definitely difficult disposition, he will agree and he will swear that he will do something about it immediately. But he's told that he shouldn't keep his mind on his business while he's dying in his hospital bed. He will assure the physician that he has had no further interest in money, because he knows he's behind and beyond the case of where he can do anything about it. But the doctor watches carefully, and the first day that there is an improvement in the physical condition of the patient. He wants a copy of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> he's right back doing the things he's always done. As soon as there is hope, he will break the rules. When there seems to be no hope, he will keep the rules for a short time. Now, society is in, doing, in the much the same situation. When society is as bad off as it is here now in the world, it will promise almost anything. But as soon as it feels a little better, it will order its equivalent to the Wall Street Journal. It will go right back to what it wants to do. Confucius made this uh, observation years ago in China, that the individual is in some mysterious way so dominated by his own will that he will continue in his course even if it leads to his own destruction. We find, uh, for instance, nowadays a lot of emphasis on diets. Diets are a dozen a dozen, a dollar. But all of these diets put together accomplish very little permanent result. 
the individual finally gives up trying because it is too difficult upon him or in case unwisely done it is too dangerous but all the way along the way we are constantly tempted to do the things that we shouldn't do and as many of these things are glamorous and apparently pleasant we are almost certain to compromise our principles now then uh, here is another phase of it. If the present television programs are not sufficient to create neurosis, they will continue until they do. <laughs> we will find that more and more intelligent people are turning off the sets. This is a sign of a slowly emerging maturity. It is an indication that the individual is realizing to some degree that what he is watching is influence, influence his thoughts, his emotions, and his attitudes toward life. He's also beginning to realize that his children are being very adversely conditioned. And yet you pass a law to prevent this type of thing, and everyone nearly would vote against it. This is the type of problem we have in personal life, to try to make something work quietly consistently and intelligently. Some time ago, a group of people came together for a very interesting experiment. They were old friends and all knew each other, and each one was told to make a statement of what he considered to be the most detrimental factor in the life of one of the others. There were no names were put on, they were, it was confidential, but each person finally had someone that told him why he was wrong. That worked pretty well. well. I knew one of the members of that little group. They said I had a wonderful time. Of course, nobody paid any attention to it. <laughs> they just kept on doing as they had been doing. And if they'd known who said it, there would have been an unpleasant relationship. <laughs> but because nobody knew, it was all fun. But the truth of the matter was, many valuable suggestions were made, but they weren't followed. So start out some morning in the day as you go along, and see how you handle the day. See how long you can go without fretting, or without being interrupted in something you've considered terribly important. Or that you don't have an argument over the price of something. That you don't re open a paper and find the world so bad you can hardly stand it or that you go out and everyone is cheating you and go on through until you finally catch up with relatives and relations and have even worse times with them <laughs> keep on going through the day and see what have you have what you have actually accomplished in the way of smoothing out your own inner life it was said by the chinese that the wise men of old slept without dreams and this was exactly what is meant all these pressures finally come through into the subconscious and either come out through dream symbolism or out through character or body disorders. So see what you can know, notice. See whether you are always expecting the worst and that you are desperately surprised if it doesn't happen. In fact, a little disappointed because when you expect something and it doesn't happen, in a sense, it is a, an indictment of your own judgment, and people don't like that. But try to see what would happen if you could go through all these problems without being moved, without being discouraged, without being excited or irritated. The phone rings, and it's the wrong number. That would be a chance to be irritated. But don't be irritated. You get a, a letter which is unpleasant, or you get a bill that you don't think you owe, or something of that kind, and more tension, more stress. And yet all the things that we consider to be dishonorable, and which we want to do something about, we can meet and handle without one single heave of the inner life. We can do it in a simple, matter-of-fact, reasonable way without building any type of attitude. We can meet dishonesty with a simple attitude of realization that it is so, but no emotional stress. That we can try to solve problems 
with clear judgment and calm thinking, but without emotional excitement, fatigue, or worry. Things that are worth worrying about will not be changed by worry. Therefore, the worries have to be faced quietly and solved. And there should be no overjudgment. We should never condemn ourselves constantly for something or condemn other people. We should look into our marriages and our relationships with our children and see just exactly what the background motivations are. Are we motivated by, the, by selfishness? Are we a see seeking escape from responsibility? If we are always looking to get away from the responsibilities of living and living only in an atmosphere of eternal opportunities, we'll be in trouble. Everything has its price. Happiness must be deserved. All the things that we want that are real and good, we must justly require because we deserve them, never because we want them. Our desires are beyond number, but our needs are few. So we uh, gradually can get past this point, which especially in older years has a tendency to close in and interfere with health. The individual may live a long time, by the way, with a bad disposition. I've seen it happen. <laughs> but it was, it was not much of a success. They simply prolonged their own grudge against some humanity. They only kept on being sorry for themselves and, and it lasted a few long years of that attitude when they would probably have been happier if they hadn't lived. They would have been much better if they'd gone at a reasonable age. But old age is an opportunity for philosophical consideration of values. It is an opportunity for the improvement of the inner life and it is a continuing opportunity to learn and to grow. But if these factors are missing, then it is simply a burden. But the Lord arranged it that way because if people do not do what is right, whatever they do must be a burden. This type of thinking can work. It has come to the West as a, quite a bit through Zen, which has been an oriental philosophy of quietude, a philosophy that discovers realities in a sense by the humor of life by the realization that so many of these terrible disasters are really funny if you can get away from your own ego many things that seem to us to be inevitable and terribly important fade entirely from the consciousness of a good Zen man <coughs> Zen is a, a quietude a living smoothly through life a living in which there is no rejection of duty, but duty no longer becomes a burden, it becomes a fulfillment. And an individual who serves with fretting and with the re reservations and considers himself underprivileged because his burdens are too heavy is simply losing the most, op the most beautiful opportunity for growth that there is. The heavier the burden, the greater the opportunity to grow. Growth does not come from lying down, like the old hymn says, and floating off to heaven on flowery beds of ease. It, com it comes from hard work well done. If we can learn to like nature, we can have a much better time of it. Now, in the West, religion has gradually drifted away from responsibility. You very seldom see a, an, a, an article on re modern religion that really gets down to the the very heart of the matter. You very seldom hear a preacher who really gives an, an, an important sermon that has to do with people living up to their convictions if they have them. These things seem to fade away and now uh, membership in various religions is largely a, socialist, uh, a social uh, relationship. It is that the individual joins others who find a, an intelligent or attractive preacher and uh, attend that church. But the real living of it is not given the thought that it should. And the vicarious atonement is just about as bad, if not worse. The individual is not relieved from the responsibility of his mistakes simply by acknowledging them. He must correct them. He must be able to prove 
that in every way he has sought to remove from his life that which is discrediting to himself or his environment. If the person keeps on worrying long enough, they have a series of problems that can become very unpleasant. It is a very not common cause of nearly all chronic ailments. Chronic being something that represents a chronic factor in the disposition. The afflicted people have often recognized, and more often should have, that this chronic problem arises from unchangeable and inflexible attitudes that are wrong. It is the result of living a life with a wrong basic pattern of existence. And, and of course, this is becoming more common all the time, with education failing entirely to emphasize the importance of integrities in life. Everything now is to get there quick, make money fast, and run a computer. Without these great gracious factors, life is unimportant. Actually, education is not doing what it should. It is not helping a person to realize that he is responsible for his own conduct. An education that gives no inspiration undoubtedly weakens character and gradually brings the individual down to ruin. So we have to take over the, all these problems ourselves. We have to take them over in any way and every way that we can. We take them over sometimes in prayerfulness, in which we ask divine strength for the changes that we should make in ourselves. Prayerfulness is, however, not very effective if it is not accompanied by a distinct and definite effort to achieve the improvement that we believe to be necessary. Deity helps those that help themselves. And the individual who is trying and striving in the name of truth will be sustained and supported by truth. But unless there is a dedication to the improvement of a situation, nothing changes. Chronic ailments very often slow down the patterns of life. Emotional ailments of all kinds, hates, fears, and so forth, certainly affects their circulation and cardiac activities. The individual who has a poorly organized life physically and has been subject to constant emotional stress, fears, hates, anxieties, and worries will surely have heart problems will surely have the troubles with the body, trying to live through the mistakes of the dweller therein. To dwell in the body is a burden upon the spirit. But the body is never really to blame. The body is simply an, an overcoat. It's certainly a vehicle that we use for an adjustment in the material world. The body, in a, of itself, is a very natural, healthy, kindly thing. But by the time we afflict it for generation after generation, and by heredity inherit a mass of delinquencies, the body comes to be uneasy. Now, no medicine can really correct this, because almost every medicine has to destroy some function. It has to slow down the, wor the worries by slowing down the thinking. And this is not the good answer. The individual, having inherited a body that has some aptitudes and some abilities, can consider himself to be a small god ruling over a little universe which is himself. Now, it's not such a small universe, if you want to consider it correctly. There are more life units in the average human body than there are living things on the earth. One body. Millions and billions of living units that must work together for the salvation of the body. Over this is God, God in this case being the self that inhabits the body. This self has all kinds of privileges and opportunities. It can be a good and conscientious leader, serving wisely and lovingly the needs of the body. It can be a good master 
of builders and workers. It can be a great inspiration. It can regulate the conduct of the body so that it never becomes involved in dangerous pursuits. It also can prevent the individual from destroying his own body by intemperance. For intemperance is in the body of man is something like the Atlantic deluge on the face of the earth. All of the things that are necessary to our survival can be controlled and can be controlled by the master of the show. But if the self within this body is determined to use it for only the gratification of personal attitudes, if this individual will destroy rest, will lose his sense of humor, which is very dangerous, and will one way or another discourage and dissipate the body's functions, he will be sick. He will be sick because he has broken the rules that the body says it must keep. So in all the things we do in life, in business and everything else, we are constantly breaking rules. And then in the newspaper a little later we hear about bankruptcies and great losses and uh, various disasters to the life of the person. We also find now na natural disasters. We find, that, as we do today, constant references now to floods, typhoons, earthquakes, plagues, pestilences, are everywhere. And all these things together seem to add up to something. I know that long years ago, we were trying to make a research project on the co correlation between earthquake phenomena and war. And there seems to be a definite relationship. Nearly always, earthquakes are associated or very closely connected with social upheavals. Why, we do not necessarily know exactly, but there is some kind of a magnetic relationship uh, between natural phenomena and the human being. I, I think this is uh, well brought out in a, a very cute little article saw on the paper not long ago, that there was suddenly a complete loss of catfish in Japan. No one could buy a catfish. And when they searched into the matter a little ways, they found out that this catfish is the great Japanese, Japanese earthquake warner. Uh, the catfish is the first to know that an earthquake is going to happen. So there was a report out seismologically that an earthquake threatens and everybody went out and buys catfish. And they keep it in a little bowl at home and they feed it regularly and they watch it. And if this little catfish became, becomes very happy and flutters around in a perfectly natural way, all is well. But if it gets nervous and disturbed and jumps up and down in the tank and uh, becomes obviously distraught, the earthquake will follow in a very short time. This is perhaps something a way of judging about Earth, that nearly all nature has ways of estimating approaching earthquakes. Now, if this is true, then is it not quite possible that there is a psychic connection between emotional conduct, visible circumstances, human attitudes, and seismic disorders? If the catfish gets unhappy and an earthquake follows, then we can say, or might be able to say, when mankind becomes unhappy and confused, a war follows. Wars and pestilences seemingly are simply the outcomes of some magnetic relationship between the individual and nature. We find them always increasing, and we now find a new type of earthquake, and that is terrorism. Terrorism is probably the, one of the last and ultimate forms of the proof of the failure of perspectives and circumstances. Here we have a race most highly developed in science and many other fields that is unable to correct or accomplish its own morality. These things we have to bear in mind. And while we can't do all about them uh, all the time, we must realize that a temper fit is an earthquake in the body. We must realize that it is a highly detrimental thing that it's something that is happening to us as a direct result 
of an unreasonable attitude, an unreasonable relationship with life, or the breaking of natural laws, which has forced nature which to, resort, to re, uh, resource in trouble. We must realize all the time that plagues and pestilences arise in the body. We know what happens when the body is subjected to cocaine. We know what happens when it is subjected to marijuana. We know these things are what they are. But above everything else is the grim determination to do exactly as we please. Now most people don't go to that extreme with it. Uh, they, they will not sacrifice willingly and knowingly life or health just to do what they please. But if the individual does what he pleases and his ple what he pleases is not right, he is bound to have trouble. And no amount of flavor that is pleasant will take care of the factors that have caused the trouble. Therefore, each person must recognize that there is only one way in which he can assure himself of a maximum bodily support for his mental and emotional life. And that is that he is a good ruler over his body, that he takes proper care of it, that he does for it that which it needs, that he does not uh, dissipate it, that he does not open himself to contagions and diseases simply because of carelessness or indifference. That if he does not think straight, he is going to suffer. And wherever he breaks the Ten Commandments, suffering gets in there somewhere. Every nation of importance in the whole world has had its equivalent of the Ten Commandments. They represent not necessarily the will of God in words imposed upon a prophet on the crest of Sinai. The Ten Commandments are man's natural realization over a period of thousands of years that affects call, follow causes as the wheel of the cart follows the foot of the ox. Whatever we do has its natural and inevitable consequence. Therefore we have Ten Commandments, and we also have additional commandments given by Christ. We have the Ten Commandments in China, in India, in Persia, in Egypt, in Greece, and Rome, in most cases disregarded. And as the disregard grew greater, the countries fell. Because these inevitable rules have to be obeyed. Now the Egyptians were a little more generous in this matter. They weren't satisfied with ten or a dozen commandments. They had what was called the negative com uh, uh, confession of faith. And it is found in the papyri of the Book of the Dead which is more really the book of the coming forth by day. For it means it's the book that is placed with the body in the tomb when the spirit goes forth into the green valleys of Amentet. But in any event, the, the spirit has to stand before the judgment of Osiris, where the scales and the balances stand, and he must make the confession of faith. And if he, is dead, if he lies or contradicts himself or misstates something, the jury of assessors, from which our jury system later came, uh, bear witness to this. And if his crimes are slight, he may be forgiven. If they are great, he must return to the world and try again. But in this confession of faith, he has to admit any fault that he has. And he also has to swear under oath as a spirit waiting for immortality, in which no longer any substitute gives any value whatsoever. He has to say, in my life, I have never hated a human being. In my life, I have dis never dishonestly dealt with a human being. In my former life, I swear that wherever there was suffering, I did all I could to help. That I owe no man anything, that I have never borrowed money at usury, that I have never failed to pay my debts, that I have never failed to worship the gods, that I have never failed to keep the peace. All of these things, up to over 100 items, must be met 
before the soul can go into the blessed regions. Now this is a little extravagant perhaps, a little more than is absolutely necessary, but it meant that way back 5,000 years ago, the condition of human life here and hereafter is based upon a code of solid integrities. These integrities are the basis of right action that the individual who has, has never failed to support his parents, who has never failed to guard and guide the lives of his children, all these things he has to witness, affirm. And the assessors who have all kinds of metaphysical eyes to see things can instantly detect any error or any falsification that he makes. So this is a, perhaps an ideal statement of Earth and its ultimate, man's destiny carried forward into the infinity. <clears throat> but the fact remains that these codes of conduct where kept protects nations, where broken nations fall. The decline and fall of the Roman Empire is set forth by Gibbon as a good example of this. It shows how little by little a strong and upright people gradually deteriorated into luxury and dissipation and were gradually overwhelmed by barbarians who were still clean. <clears throat> we have this today, except that we are short of barbarians. We are no longer have other tribes that are going to come in. If anything goes wrong now, it must be ourselves doing it to ourselves. But the fact remains that health, happiness, security, integrity, and a proper relationship with life demands self-discipline. It demands that we learn to do those things which are right and do them now. And uh, it's very unpleasant and disillusioning to see uh, selfishness masquerading as religion, self-interest and uh, ulterior motives uh, supported or sustained by so-called quotations from scripture to find that the individual uses these principles not to improve himself but in one way or another to avoid them and try to force them on others. It's absolutely necessary for this generation to find itself in a way that it can then turn to other things. The moment the individual becomes uh, in integrated and no longer s supports or ad advocates or endures the corruptions of his time. He becomes in a sense free. He may lose his opportunity for great wealth. He may not be the one that is promoted to the highest position. But he is the ind individual who is gradually t changing himself into a citizen of eternity. He is a person who is living in the true universe as it is, a universe of integrities, a universe of honor. He is preparing himself for infinite citizenship in an infinite plan of things. Whereas those who are not so dedicated must in due time uh, return and stay with it until they awaken to these values. Now these values are not going to all awaken at once either even in one person. They're going to grow slowly as the individual begins to appreciate and understand his real needs. They're going to become more and more obvious to him as he grows. If he takes the first step towards self-improvement, the second step will be easier and more obvious. All the way along, he is in the position, as soon as he so desires, to realize that his time in this world is brief. And though he may return a number of times, even altogether it will be brief. But he is here to become aware of the infinity of his own inner life. He is here to know that a divine power lives in him, and that this divine power is crucified every time he corrupts himself. That it is necessary for him, therefore, to protect this being within him, from that personality which is indeed a holy sepulchre from which that being must rise triumphant 
through the accomplishment of discipline and integration in illumination. Now, illumination is a term in religion which has many meanings. Some consider illumination to be a form of clairvoyance or second sight. Some consider illumination to be a mystical experience involving values completely out of this world. Some regard it as the highest possible experience of, relig of religious values. But illumination, what it is finally and all summed up, is the complete acceptance and realization that our destiny is in our own hands. Its illumination is the realization that the path that we should follow is the path which will bring us in the end to reunion and identity with the divine being. That illumination is the revelation of our own need and how it can be solved. It is the statement of an internal presence which breaks through for a moment and gives us a message that we must never forget. Plotinus, the Neoplatonist, said that he had illumination for only a few seconds twice during his lifetime, but that these two or three seconds of really internal, fully comprehension of the entire pattern of things became so important that they could never be forgotten and nothing could ever be done contrary to them because there was the inevitable stamp of eternity upon them. And in the presence of that, all earthly uh, pressures instantly faded away. The uh, person starting out now with the hope of improving health can start with little ordinary things, a little greater integrities, a little greater sincerities. Uh, sincerity is the most powerful force. When the individual is totally sincere, he is t seldom completely wrong. He is always trying to do something better. Sincerity is lack of ulterior motive. An ulterior motive is one of the deadliest of the sins. If we have all kinds of little corruptions floating around in our natures, we are going to have heartaches, headaches, we are going to have high blood pressure, we are going to have all kinds of things, because these attitudes actually damage the little cells and lives within ourselves. The human body is a strange magnetic field. It is a field of infinite life in motion. The human body is a, a field for a great magnetic sphere which surrounds it. The human body is tied to all of its parts by magnetic pressures and uh, by attitudes. The magnetic field is in many colors. And as you study the situation very carefully, you make some interesting discoveries. With every mood that the individual has, the colors of the magnetic field change. They can be the colors of rainbows. They can be beautiful shades. Or if the individual is jealous and, or nagging or combative, or dirty mad colors come in, dull, uh, unpleasant, storm-like appearances. And in this magnetic field, as in a small universe, great thunderstorms can arise, lightning can flash, torments, uh, torrents and torments spring up. The purgatory seems to flare in the very atmosphere. All of these things are the result of the individual misusing his own abilities and powers. The magnetic field is a kind of psychic thermometer which tells how near the truth he is. And wherever there is a departure from truth, these magnetic currents are disturbed. And wherever they are disturbed, organs are disturbed, particularly the endocrine system. And when the endocrine system is disturbed, the, all the physical functions become disturbed, disordered, and sick. Therefore, an individual who is wrong is bound to be sick at something. He's bad mentally sick, emotionally sick, physically sick, psychologically sick. He is either healthy because he is right or unhealthy because he is wrong. Uh, the uh, great problems of uh, life come as uh, we don't always quite understand a statement attributed in the Bible, namely that it is not that which goeth in at the mouth, but that which cometh out of the mouth that defileth a man. 
it sounds as though even by best dietitians it should be the opposite but it is right because that which comes to us from the inside from the uh, from the outside is not our problem it is something that we should meet with the best that we have but what comes out of ourselves in the, out of our hearts our minds our bodies our thoughts these things if they are wrong they are the things which destroy or damage the human being every unkind word that is spoken to us is carried by someone but not by us but every one unpleasant or destructive word we pronounce is ours and we must live with it until we transmute it and the great alchemy of life to my mind is the power to transmute the inabilities and incompletenesses and the infirmities of ourselves into eternal assets this transformation is the regeneration of the individual this was the great secret of mysticism this was the secret work of the rosicrucians and the alchemists and all of the ancient secret societies everything had to do with the individual gaining the power to discipline himself to rise above his own weaknesses and to become a living image of truth in a world disordered and if we do this we have the natural compensation we define we find that we are allowed to face life in an entirely different way and no matter what happens happy or unhappy we will face it and we'll find in the end a joy that can never be found from a mistake now we watch the economic and political processes going around us today they are rather pathetic they are tiresome they are wearisome they frighten us and we don't know what's going to happen next but as actually the person who is integrated who is really at peace with themselves who lives in a realization of the presence of the divine in all things that happens is able to realize that he shouldn't not forget the presence of the divine in the things he doesn't like it is easy enough to think that if to think that if all people lived well developed and in peace and served each other nobly and generously and kindly that then we would have the utopia and that anything less than that is something that we have to accept as a terrible thing actually the things that happen to us are not terrible things they are merely our own birds coming home to roost they are the things we have done returning to us when we stop causing trouble trouble stops but this uh, trouble that we have is a great inspiration to get over it in the last two or three years there has been m more movement towards individuals taking on the responsibilities of life there are more efforts to find peace not by law but by people gathering in contemplative integrity there are more efforts to reform education there are new attitudes toward law and to science and to philosophy and philosophy which for the last decade or two has been very moribund is apt to come to life again we, we don't have much in philosophy because it is nearly all in the field of experimental thinking but the old classic works are coming back I have noticed in catalogs that books that have been out of print the very valuable books that have been out of print for a hundred years are now coming back for the dozens everyone is beginning to be interested in the thinking and the d deep believing the loving the hoping of the of the great world family and that uh, modern reading with its very tempestuous iconoclasm is of no value to us in our needs what we need is to find our roots again in the wisdom literature of our race and find in all the things that we do everything that is inspiring and clinging to it actually in this field of thinking of constructive reorganization there is a tremendous increase and every bombing every massacre is bringing the day of wisdom closer and as Krishna at the battle of Kurukshetra in India 
and he appeared to the charioteer Arjuna, the prince of men. Uh, Arjuna said, how shall it be that I can go and make war to my own family? For I see the army drawn up and my own family is waiting to attack me and I am waiting to attack them. And Krishna appeared in a vision at that moment and reminded the young prince, he said, do not fear, never the living can die. Nothing can be anything but change. No one will ever kill anyone. It is all a great dream world, a world of physical fa factors which we have made real when the great world of beauty that we should have made been making real has been ignored. All these things that are happening are dreams. Those who die in battle will live in peace. Those who do all these things will rise again wiser, a little better, a little more noble, a little more unselfish. And that these things are all shadows, phantoms, passing, the inevitable consequences of man's inhumanity to man. But out of it all will rise the one great humanity acceptable to God. All these things we have to face, but in daily life most of us do not face the worst of it. But we can worry about the worst of it. But the most important thing is not to worry, but to make sure that in our personal actions, and our personal thoughts and attitudes, we see the truth, we believe in the truth, we decide to live the truth, and we have not a hope based upon phantoms, but an absolute certainty that in the great plan of things, everything works together for good. Out of all the confusion, the chaos, the suffering, and the pain comes a great solution and it is for that reason that we were created. We were created to grow and to finally become conscious of our divine birthright and conscious of our place in an infinite plan that is governed not only by the wisdom of God, but by the love of man to man and the truth that we hope to gradually to make manifest. The whole thing is not one to get all sick and sad about. It is the, it, the uh, thing that we must accept and transmute ourselves into the realization that we are in a universe that is not the object and subject of infinite human vicissitudes, but that man ultimately must follow the path that was his in the beginning. Out of this great materialistic urge for success has come a great disaster and it will continue as long as man puts the wrong things first. But when he realizes the facts of things, when he realizes the truth, he will ascend to be greater than the angels. He is here to learn, but it must be the hard way because it is constantly fighting his own negative uh, inherited dispositional trends and characteristics. But if you want to be healthy, you want to get over the pressures of the time, you must take a larger look and see beyond all the tyrannies of human relationship the magnificent and eternal love of God for everything that lives. For all of this is going together to bring about this golden time we look for, a time which will be better than anything we have ever known. But each of us must wake up as individuals and begin to understand and see what it's all about. Well, thank you very much.